we are in the early stages of what is probably going to be uh, a two-year recession. So that's where I think we are right now. Uh, and the beauty about this call is that it is uh, uh, separates itself from the consensus view that uh, we're going to uh, experience a soft landing um, or a short and shallow recession. Um, it could be shallow. It's not going to be short. The catalyst is going to have to be to get us out of the recession, uh, which is, it looks like it started even earlier than I thought. Uh, I'll just say at the outset that uh, although back to back negative quarters of GDP isn't the technical official NBER defined recession, uh, it's, a, it's a Wall Street rule of thumb uh, because it always works. Uh, whenever you've had back to back negative quarters, you've been in recession. Uh, whenever you've had two quarters down out of three, you've been in recession 100% of the time. So that's where we are. Um, there's really no doubting it unless you want to attack the historical record. Um, but you see, the reason why I think it's going to be long is because it's already started. And so has the Fed tightening cycle just started in March. And the peak impact on the economy from whatever the Fed does, whether it's easing or whether it's tightening, uh, there's lags involved because the economy ongoingly resets to a different interest rate regime. The, the lags are generally um, about 12 months. And the Fed only started raising rates in March, and they've gone a long way. They've gone 225 basis points. Uh, and even once they pause, they're still going to be undertaking balance sheet reduction. So they'll still be tightening policy even after they move to the sidelines and interest rates. Fiscal policy continues to operate in a way that is contractionary for the economy. So the question is going to be, uh, what is uh, the catalyst? And I think ultimately the catalyst will be a move back to disinflation that gives the Fed the opportunity to ease monetary policy. Uh, but that's not going to happen immediately. And we have a situation where the Fed has been shamed um, because it blew the, reset, the inflation call, chose the wrong word, because although they weren't wrong on transitory, transitory doesn't have a timestamp in any definition. Um, but they panicked. Uh, the Fed, even in the face of back-to-back -back quarters of negative growth, and it's a debate as to whether or not Jay Powell saw to, you know, today's GDP report yesterday, the Fed has been tightening into a recession, uh, which really only happened during the Volcker era in the early 1980s, when you had back-to-back -back recessions separated six, you know, a year apart. You could almost argue that that whole period was about a three-year recession. And you have a central bank chief um, who, in March, in front of Richard Shelby uh, at uh, a Senate uh, committee presentation. Uh, Powell did not compare himself to Arthur Burns or William Miller uh, or Alan Greenspan or Ben Bernanke. He brought up the fact that uh, Paul Volcker was the greatest economic public servant uh, who ever lived. And um, we know that Volcker killed inflation by killing the economy. The Fed's not going to do anything until it sees the whites of the eyes of inflation, headline inflation heading back down towards its target. Um, so you could argue they were late. They were late uh, to tighten policy. They're probably going to be late to ease policy. Um, but that tells me that when I trace through the lags within what the Fed does, trace it through to what it means for the economy, I think we're looking at a two-year recession. Uh, I don't know so much about the magnitude. So much of that will depend, I think, on uh, the extent to which we have a big negative wealth effect on spending if the housing market joins the equity market uh, in an asset price deflation, I think that's quite possible. Uh, the extent to which these uh, high cash balances just stay as high cash balances on the household balance sheet instead of diverting its way into the real economy, which is what most economists and the Fed thinks. It's, so it's, it's hard to say how deep it's going to be. It's more important to identify when is the start of the next bull market? Uh, when will that start from whatever level it's going to be? 
And historically, that's two thirds of the way through the recession. That is actually when people say that nobody rings the alarm bell at the lows. Well, actually, if you can try and time the contours of the economy through the lags from Fed policy, uh, you can come up with a reasonable approximation as to when, as opposed to what level, but the timing of when it's going to be safe to dip toes back into the risk pool, you know, outside of these intermittent bear market rallies. What's the fundamental low? The fundamental low takes place at the tail end of the Fed easing cycle and the tail end of the economic recession. The, the Fed is extremely important. Without the Fed, there's no recovery in risk assets in March of 2020. Okay. So uh, just as an example, uh, you know, without the Fed, I started in the business on October 19th, 1987. There's some of us, I think, that would remember that day. There's just a absolute cataclysmic decline from those levels without the Fed. Uh, and there's just countless other examples. Yeah, so the, so the Fed, it matters a lot. And um, there's no way you can make a call on a steeper yield curve uh, without making a call on the Fed. Um, because the curve will only steep in two ways. Either bond yields ratchet up, and I guess that would happen if we had a another inflation scare, or the curve steepens in a more benevolent way because the Fed cuts interest rates. But what I'm gonna say is that when you look at the contours, when you look at the contours of the business cycle, um, you know, since the Fed was created in 1913, you'll see very clearly that um that the chart of interest rates and the chart of the economy. Uh, there's a, a, a near perfect correlation. It's just that one lags the other. One lags the other. Um, interest rates lead economic growth. And the lags are long and variable, um, but that's exactly uh, what's happened. We have a, a bear market rally. It is, you can say, maybe it's premised on this view that we're going to have a soft landing. If you have a view that there's a soft landing, then the market bottomed in mid June. Uh, that's not your view, it's not my view. If your view is that we actually have a recession on our hands and then the next leg is not going to be even so much the multiple, uh, but it's going to be earnings, then you have at least another 20% down from here. And that would be consistent with the historical track record of how the stock market behaves around recessions. There's a lot of psychology involved and uh, the markets like what Powell had to say. Uh, but the reality is this, the reality is that we are in the early stages of a recession, and the Fed still has a tightening directive on its books. Uh, we used to call this uh, tightening bias back in the old days. Very few Federal Reserves would still be tightening monetary policy in this economic environment, but we're dealing with a much different inflationary backdrop. We have the first shooting war in 80 years in Europe. We've had these recurring supply shocks. Complicating it was um, really quite uh, unnecessary fiscal stimulus for the most part. Stimulus checks that got spent right away, exacerbated for a period of a year. You know, it's funny that uh, Jay Powell says, yeah, you know, we've had this inflation now and it's lasted about a year. It's lasted a year. Uh, he makes it sound like a year is a long time. Uh, I'm there thinking because I am I fancy myself as an economic historian, a year in the overall annals of economic financial history, I don't know. I think that might well be transitory. You know, look, the last time sample size of one uh, that we had um, a war and a health crisis that went global uh, was back, say, from 1916 to 1920. You know, we we back then the war started first, then the Spanish flu. We had four years where inflation averaged 15 percent per year. Now we didn't have like social media back then. Uh, but we had we had inflation that wasn't nine percent uh, for a year. We had fifteen percent over a four year period because we had a series of supply shocks. Wars historically tend to be inflationary, and we had a global supply shock on top of that from what happened with the Spanish flu. Once those pressures subsided, and they didn't last indefinitely. Okay, there are no new eras. Excesses are never permanent. Once those pressures subsided, we went through 10 years of deflation. You had a different labor market, a different level. You know, people talk about, you know, it's funny that you didn't, you mentioned globalization. You didn't talk about the return of labor power, the return of labor power, please, because these young people are job hopping in the restaurant and accommodation sector. 
you know that despite all the hype and rhetoric about oh well you know amazon workers here uh, they're certified now union and starbucks over here you know that you know what is it it's over 300 million workforce and you you read the headlines of the wall street journal wow we got the return of labor power that's not happening it's happening in a few sectors it's not happening in fact the share of the private sector workforce that's unionized last year went to a new post world war ii low <laughs> so there you go in the in the 1970s it was you, you, i mean inflation was almost institutionalized because uh the the economy was unionized and everybody had cost of living allowances. Oh. the participation rate you know the participation rate in the united states it peaked 20 years ago yeah before covid and all these supply shocks inflation was like two percent donald trump could actually cut interest or, or give us a trillion dollar tax cut and uh, the fed could continue re-embark on QE in 2019 with three and a half percent unemployment rate at the lows and inflation was two percent and so yeah you're 100 correct on that uh that uh but it's it's like I said before aging populate it's all about the you know, people talked about the great the great retirement yeah okay so there's the great retirement as long as that lasted now people who have seen their 401ks depleted they'll come back into the labor market but be that as it may the participation rate's been going down for over 20 years and there is no perceptible inflationary impact whatsoever we have more economic pain ahead and so there is a misalignment between company order books production schedules and staffing so what's going to happen when you do the arithmetic on what it will mean to right size productivity um and you're already starting to see it happen but not in bodies but hours worked are starting to come down and that's a great leading indicator hours you're talking about Raul you're talking about in the next year two million jobs are going to be lost we are in a huge productivity recession it is not sustainable and unless you believe we're going to have a rebound in output which no leading indicator is suggesting we're going to employment is going to have to be right sized now in the past year we've created six million jobs I'm not saying all six million go by the wayside but a third of that is going to go by the wayside and if that's the case which I think is going to be normal and a natural part the reality is that the business sector everybody made mistakes and if you followed the Fed's forecast at the end of last year, not on inflation, but they bungled it on the real economy. Nobody talks about the fact that they, they, it's all about transitory. Nobody talks about the fact that they had a 4% growth forecast, and now GDP growth for the year is going to be zero. Companies overhired. Now they have to basically correct that process. It's going to be pretty painful. Two million job loss in the next year is, um, is going to be pretty painful. It means the unemployment rate is going to beat, is going to head back up to 5% from three and a half. And that alone... When you trace out what that means for wages as you build more excess capacity and what used to be a tight labor market wage growth goes from five percent to two and a half percent so you see what you were saying before i mean let's hope that, i mean getting inflation down is going to be very important because wage growth is going to be dissipating when you get the real relative valuation support for the equity market well what's the dividend yield is 1.6 uh the 10-year note is call it uh 2.8 um well maybe there's a meeting of the minds in between but either the 10-year note goes to one six or the s p might have to go to well it would have to basically go down around 2200 to, to or there's a meeting of the minds in between but everything that i'm seeing by the way you need to get if you're bullish on equities you have to be bullish on bonds first there's never been a recession low in equities that wasn't followed by a huge rally in treasuries. I, I think in an overshoot to the downside, we can get to one and a half percent. Um, but I'm 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 thinking we're gonna break below two percent. And at that point I'll make up my mind as to whether or not it's time to uh take the bet off the books or uh double down on it. It'll be situational, predicated on where we are in the cycle, the degree to which my call has worked out or hasn't worked out. But I think it's as much as there's anything uh as a, a no-brainer of a call and they don't typically exist but I say that in recessions in recessions by the way in recessions inflation goes down yes how much that's the question mark but in every recession bond yields go down there's there's really never been a recession where bonds didn't make you money total return now it's more challenging today in the sense that you don't have the coupon but then again the convexity gives you uh a nice uh capital appreciation if I'm right on where the 10-year note's going to go in the next year 
Uh, I'm not even saying, I'm not saying, I mean, you can go and buy long dated zeros, you know, <laughs> or just buy long bonds. I'm just talking about the 10 year note, 14% um, total return in the next year, if my call uh, comes to fruition.